The SAS gunners let rip with their combined 68 Vickers Ks, each spitting out up to 1200 rounds per minute. Alright y'all, welcome back to Coming Arms Channel. Okay, so today we're checking out some more SAS stuff, and I gotta say, I'm pretty excited about this video, because this is talking about the SAS in North Africa. Now, we've heard bits and pieces about the SAS in Africa, especially like, I'm, the thing that sticks in my mind the most is y'all telling me how they're wearing like pink as like their camouflage. I guess it worked really well when they were doing their sort of operations in North Africa. So that's pretty cool. And of course you see all the videos of them rolling around in like their desert like Jeeps or something. I don't know, it just looks really fascinating. And some of the stories that I've heard a little bit are just really, really cool. So hopefully this video gives us a little bit of background as to how they're doing their operations in North Africa. But this is from the operations room. They do a lot of really solid stuff, especially like sort of military battles. And they do a pretty good job of sort of dissecting it and getting us to understand it. So I'm pretty excited. Hopefully you guys are too. Let's get into it. On the night of July the 7th, 1942, L Detachment of the Special Air Service, SAS, led by Major David Sterling, is once again raiding Hell enemy yeah. airfields far behind enemy lines. <laughs> the SAS so cool. is a fairly new unit, formed by Sterling as Rommel's Africa Corps pushed British forces back into Egypt, threatening the Suez Canal, the vital supply line to the Far Eastern theatres. So was North, I, I know I'm pausing it already, but was North Africa the reason why the SAS were developed in the first place? I know it's nice to have that sort of capability and be able to use it in different areas, but it seems like it was literally, I don't know if Dave, David Sterling was actually in this area and that's why he wanted to develop a team to work specifically to counter what the Germans were doing. But yeah, it's kind of interesting if their actual roots are literally just from North Africa, because it seems like they were made and they did a lot of stuff in North Africa, but if they're made for North, North Africa, it's a slightly different dynamic. It's pretty cool to hear about. The SAS's primary task is to destroy as many enemy aircraft on the ground as possible, to cripple the Luftwaffe and hinder the crucial air transport of supplies for the Axis ground forces in North Africa. That's cool, that's cool in tonight's mission. tonight's operation, Five raiding groups, each in three jeeps, will approach three separate German and Italian airfields, infiltrate onto the flight line, attach Lewis incendiary bombs to as many aircraft as possible, <laughs> and then slip away into the desert night. Sterling so and cool. his force dismount I wonder, their... I, know, I know I'm pausing it so much, but this is just so freaking cool to check out. Like, just to think, I mean, imagine if they didn't have any knowledge of the Brits having any commando units, their airfields probably didn't have the amount of security or posturing to detect and counter those sort of operations. So for these teams to go out in three Jeeps each and attacking all these different airfields, it's just really cool. It's just a really fascinating sort of mission to hear about, especially just all the covert stuff is like the most fascinating stuff for me. And for them to start doing this and to be the first unit to start doing it, they're literally setting the groundwork. So at this point, they're probably just rocking like tactics that they devise themselves. Vehicles at a safe distance from Bagush airfield and move out. The Major waits back, while the raiding party, led by his second in command, Captain Paddy Main, proceeds on foot oh, towards man, the airstrip. Oh man, another legend. They sneak along the lines of parked aircraft, carefully fitting Lewis bombs to over 30 Italian CR-42 biplane Damn. fighters before retreating back into the darkness. <laughs> Fused to Just explode like after the party is clear, 22 of the CR-42 Falcos erupt in flames. However, jubilation is cut short among the British soldiers watching from their rendezvous. Hmm. At least a dozen of the bombs have failed to detonate. Yeah, what's with that? A dejected Paddy Main despairs at the number of aircraft left undamaged, but Sterling has an idea. Hmm. The SAS men mount up. Oh their my two gosh! Jeeps and Sterling's personal Chevrolet staff car, nicknamed the Blitz Buggy, have been <laughs> oh modified gosh. with pairs of Vickers K machine guns, borrowed without permission from a warehouse in Alexandria. Come on, it just gets more and more badass. They're stealing a freaking machine gun from Alexandria and they're just throwing it on their, their blitz buggy. I think it's kind of just badass that, you know, these bombs went off and they're like, yeah, that's not, that's not good enough. We're going we're gonna to go in again. Like many good ideas, Sterling seems the obvious thing to do. Destroy the remaining planes by gunfire. The three vehicles trundle over oh the desert gosh. and onto the airbase once again. With the attack seemingly over, the Italian and German base personnel do not expect another venture by the SAS. Oh man, The jeeps Rookies. sneak through the perimeter in the darkness and spot the intact enemy aircraft, silhouetted by the flames from nearby destroyed aircraft. Ah. Major Sterling Chevrolet pulls up onto the flight line with the other jeeps close behind, 
loading and checking their Lewis and Vickers K machine guns. They <laughs> jostle over the tarmac at 15 miles an hour, and at close range open fire. Man, the just chattering fuselage of machine gun fire splits the night. The SAS gunners aim low at the fuselage of the aircraft to hit important components like the fuel tanks. Nice, With attention. their blistering fire rate, and the combined weight of fire from all of the vehicles, the upgunned jeeps make short work of the remaining dozen Italian CR-42s, That's insane. with the gunners having ample time to riddle each fighter as the vehicles roll past. I wonder how long that took. With all of the enemy aircraft raised, the British raiders accelerate again, pulling off the taxiway and making a beeline for the perimeter. Ugh. Sterling leads his group off the airfield, avoiding 20mm fire from the base's anti-aircraft guns and small arms fire from the now alerted defenders. No kidding. Escaping into the night once more, they make for the rendezvous with the rest of the SAS force That's and their so escort badass. from the long-range desert group. During Holy the eventful cow. desert journey back to their forward operating base at Bir el Khazar, the idea of mounted raids on enemy airfields with their jeeps is one that takes hold in Sterling's mind. <laughs> They're After getting. a handful of less successful and aborted raids over the next few days, the bulk of the combined LRDG and SAS force returns to Cairo for supplies and equipment, leaving 23 men to hold the forward operating base. I mean, again, World War II was a different time, but I'm trying to think of how these tactics would work nowadays. I guess it really depends on the force that you're going against and the sort of posturing that they have. But yeah, I mean, having a sort of mobile unit like that, especially like a sort of mobile raid team, it's just a really, really cool concept. I'm sure it might be pretty hard now, especially given like observation posts, and then you also have drones to be able to detect those pretty easily. So it might be a little bit more complicated to pull off nowadays, especially for moving like long stretches like this. But I gotta say, it is just really cool to hear about it, especially back in the day, especially during World War II. If they weren't expecting any commandos, then you couldn't really counter any commando tactics if they're literally being like developed right then. Arriving back at the 8th Army's headquarters, Sterling collects 20 new Willys Jeeps, again modified 20. with Vickers K and Browning machine guns. However, the Major feels that his unit and the capabilities of a Jeep mounted raiding force are not fully appreciated by the regular Army staff officers at 8th Army headquarters, huh, okay. and such, he sets out to prove the worth of the Special Air Service. <laughs> Returning to the Bir el Khazar base on the 23rd, the SAS spend the next few days in preparation, discussing the plan of the attack, formations and procedures, and they conduct a live fire exercise to rehearse. No kidding. So it definitely seemed like it was personal for him at this point, which you sort of hear about that every now and again during like World War II. And it's kind of cool when it actually works out, but for them to be refitting these, these vehicles with these like special machine guns, it's kind of cool to see that attention to detail that they're actually putting into their operations. Their target will be the Axis airfield at Sidi Hanesh. As the sun begins to set on the evening of the 26th, the long column of LRDG and SAS vehicles move out into the desert along the beginning of a 50 mile voyage to their target. All right. 18 Willys Jeeps make up the primary strike force, with David Sterling leading the way through the shifting sands. Damn, leading the way. Three of the 18 Jeeps are crewed not by Brits, but by three Frenchmen. After hours huh. of treacherous going, negotiating wadis, cliffs, sand dunes, and an abandoned battle. Oh, dude, battle. that's so weird to think about. Yeah, like they're literally just going across the desert right now. They're not even like using roads. <laughs> that's that is pretty cool i mean you see the pictures and whatnot but you don't get a good appreciation for how much terrain they're covering field sterling brings the force to a halt and consults with lieutenant mike sadler the major asks his new chief navigator where they are feeling that they should be nearly at the airfield by now lieutenant sadler's skills have been pushed to the limit navigating the jeeps by the stars uh -oh. and unable to use his compass properly due to the magnetism of their metal vehicles he replies, we'll get out or I reckon it's two miles ahead, and as if to miraculously prove him right, the base's runway lights come on to guide in a returning German bomber, wow. illuminating the entire airfield before them. Like, Sadler, Poof. with classic understatement, describes this as a bit of a relief. <laughs> yeah, as the exactly. SAS steadily advance towards the airfield under darkness, one of the jeeps inadvertently drives into an anti-tank ditch, and is too stuck to oh, be removed. Snap. The force comes to a halt not far from the airfield perimeter. The men transfer to other jeeps, <laughs> weapons are checked, and then the assault begins. All right. SAS trooper Stephen Hastings recalls, first one tentative burst, 
and the full ear-splitting cacophony, roaring <laughs> and spitting. A tentative verse. Strings of red like and that. white colour shot through the darkness, struck the ground and cascaded upwards in a thousand crazy arcs, crisscrossing each other. Hell yeah, On the dude. receiving end of the furious salvo, the German defences are taken completely off guard, left reeling and desperately trying to retreat from the storm of lead. <laughs> With a green flare to signal the advance, Sterling and his men move out, forming their heavily armed jeeps into two columns, and steadily moving through the dust and acrid smoke onto the airfield. That's so cool. At just two miles per hour, the jeeps stream onto the runway. The SAS gunners let rip with their combined 68 Vickers Ks, <laughs> oh, each spitting out up to 1,200 rounds per minute, pouring fire really? on the German aircraft scattered around the airfield. The incendiary ammunition rips the aircraft to shreds and sets the fuel tanks alight. Of course they have that. Recovering from the initial shock, the Italian and German defenders resist tenaciously, taking to the flight line to try and stop the SAS onslaught. Hmm. They use the heaviest weapons they can muster, their Breda anti-aircraft guns in direct fire, and they mortar That's, their own yeah, airfield. Yeah, dude, any, air, any aircraft gun in direct fire? Imagine going against that. That'd be pretty freaking intimidating. I mean, that's an understatement. But yeah, so they didn't have any sort of... I mean, it's an airfield. I imagine they're not going to have like that much like indirect fire capabilities. But if they had anti-tank ditches, I wonder if they had any sort of like anti-tank weapons like, you know, Pantashrex or what have you. But yeah, I mean, again, you're just going to be like, what the hell is going on when you have all these Jeeps just ripping with these like freaking double barrel machine guns or whatever they're they're rocking. But yeah, that rate of fire alone is just... It's insane. That'd be very, very scary to hear, especially when you have these incendiary rounds just shredding through everything and planes blowing up and stuff. To try to break up the attack. With 20mm shells from the AA guns whipping overhead, the procession of Brits and Frenchmen keep up the barrage, <laughs> loosing off streams of rounds at the silhouettes of Axis troops and hosing down defensive positions in My a chaotic gosh. melee of explosions and machine gun fire. Sheesh. With a deafening clang, Sterling's jeep grinds to a halt, spewing oil after taking a round from the AA gun straight to the engine, hmm. narrowly avoiding its passengers. Damn. Using a horn to signal, Major Sterling orders the SAS into the next phase of the attack. A horn, okay. As the column pauses briefly, and Sterling and his men clamber aboard another jeep, Paddy Main leaps from his vehicle with little regard for his own personal safety, oh, man. and fits a Lewis incendiary bomb to one of the few unharmed Junkers Ju-52 <laughs> transports. It was personal. Pressing on through the searing heat of the exploding Junkers, L detachment swings around at the end of the airfield, passing back down its far side, so to cool. cause yet more destruction, clattering away with the last of their ammunition, My to pressing yet more defensive positions. Yeah. This is why I love the operations room because like the overhead imagery that you get for this, it's just really freaking sweet. It'd be nice if you had like a satellite view back then, but of course you're not going to have much of that, especially from World War II. But like having these sorts of maps and imagery that are made and they're made with like pretty decent fidelity, I would imagine. It gives us a really good appreciation for the scope of how they're moving and all these different sorts of targets on the ground where they could be taking fire from and i like how they're doing the the actual fire as well you see a lot of it's interlocking which is pretty cool to see inflicting more casualties on the guards and shooting up more of the vital ju-52 transports <laughs> after 15 minutes of mayhem sterling fires off a red flare signaling the withdrawal nice disappearing like in a column through a gap in the perimeter fence the sas make their escape Not leaving city hanais in a burning mess Despite the intense return fire from the defenders, Lance Bombardier John Robson is the only casualty, mm. killed during the initial attack. To try to evade any enemy response, the SAS split up into packets of two or three jeeps each and drive until sunrise, then camouflage their vehicles to remain hidden through the day, that is so anticipating cool. that the survivors of their raid would be out for vengeance. Yeah, no As kidding. expected, at the crack of dawn, the Stuka dive bombers are out searching for the raiders, patrolling the likely escape routes and strafing anything that moves. Hmm. Despite the Luftwaffe's efforts, the only further loss is French SAS trooper André Zanel. Damn. And, by the 29th of July, all of the remaining Special Air Service personnel make it back to safety, to the operating base at Bir El Khazar. That's really smart too. Again, like that's kind of like a thing with recon. You go in one way and then you egress a different way. And especially if you have a big force, it's nice to be able to have that option to split up like that. Especially when they have jeeps, you know, being a little more mobile makes it easier to split up. 
because you you have a little more survivability, especially when you have you know the the mobility, but also the machine gun itself. It makes it a little bit easier to do that. And again, it's just the planning that went into this is just really freaking badass. It's pretty cut and dry when you look at it, but for the success that they actually had, it goes to show how disciplined they were and how they were covering their bases, or also using you know the initiative as far as like using a horn to to signal to move into the next phase of the operation is just cool. The SAS have destroyed 37 aircraft, including many of the Ju-52 transports <laughs> on which Rommel's supply lines so heavily depend. This success silences the doubters in the British headquarters at Cairo and cements the SAS's reputation as a highly effective fighting force, no kidding. paving the way for the successes and heroism to come, and the elite special air service as we know it today. Nice, man, just from that one man, huh? That is freaking cool. That is really setting a legacy right there. Oh man, okay, that video was exactly what I expected to see for like these old school SAS operations. And again, just picturing the, you know, the, the images that I've seen previously with the SAS in the 40s, them just in their vehicles going across the desert. I'm just trying to picture that and attribute it to this. And it's just really, really cool. Now, of course, if you guys have any other videos or anything, even like just stories to recommend, so like firsthand accounts, I mean, I want to find like autobiographies of, you know, some of the individuals mentioned in this. Definitely recommend anything you have down below or recommend it in the Discord, or you can just go in the Discord and start having a chat because, yeah, I mean, this is just, it's so cool to hear about. And I got to say, 1940, 1940s SAS are just badass. They just they just hit different as far as like the, the lineage of how new they were and how successful they were being that young. But yeah, they did a good job at maintaining you know, that, that sort of status quo. But I hope you guys enjoyed it, because I definitely did. If you did, you can hit that thumbs up, comment and let me know what you think, recommend some stuff, and definitely consider hitting that subscribe button. But I know right now, as I'm uploading this, or as I'm recording this, it's a little bit, uh, probably a month and a half prior to when you guys are actually seeing this, but definitely send some recommendations down below so when I get back to recording, I can see all the cool stuff that you guys are recommending and start doing some reactions to those so I can share it with the rest of y'all. But yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed it. That's it for this video. I'll see you on the next one.